Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to the Fredericton Chamber of Commerce 2019 Federal Election Series. My name is Ken Chris Lee. I'm a board member here with the Chamber, and today marks the final of four sessions we've been hosting with Fredericton's local candidates. Uh, thank you to everyone that's been with us so far, and thank you to everyone who's attending this morning. Uh, if you missed one of the prior events, we've actually been video recording all of these sessions. And you're going to be able to catch those when we post them on our website in the coming days. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to extend a sincere thank you to our sponsors. First, our venue sponsor, Planet Hatch. That's your cue for applause. <laughs> right. And our networking sponsor, the uh, Real Estate Board of the Fredericton area. A big thank you. Events so like this would not happen with, without sponsors uh, like Planet Hatch and the Real Estate Board in the Fredericton area, so we really, really appreciate that. Uh, we'll also be launching our Questions That Count series uh, in the coming days. Uh, we, started, we started that last week, and you'll be able to see those uh, answers on our website in the coming days as well. Now, Questions That Count uh, is an initiative that we have where we send each of the eight candidates the same set of questions and allow them to provide answers so that our members and the public can compare and contrast those candidates' issues or positions on issues that matter to Fredertonians. So, so keep an eye out for that coming on our website as well. Uh, and finally, we're also planning on sending out an email soon. It's gonna have links to all these videos, all the questions that count, all that information. So if you've not already signed up for our email list, you're gonna wanna open your favorite web browser. You're, wanna, you're gonna wanna go to fredertonchamber.ca and you're gonna wanna sign yourselves up for that, okay? Uh, this morning, we're very pleased to have with us Andrea Johnson, the Conservative Party of Canada candidate for Fredericton, and her biography reads as follows. In her 20-year career as a business development executive, Andrea has helped New Brunswick companies expand their trade and export revenues, and has successfully argued legislative tax changes while negotiating some of New Brunswick's largest business agreements. She has represented New Brunswick globally to various groups in the United States, the United Kingdom, and in Europe. She has done all of this as a single mom with four kids, now university aged. When not on the campaign trail or spending time with her family, you can find Andrea on any given river in New Brunswick fly fishing for Atlantic salmon. Now once Ms. Johnson finishes her remarks, we're gonna open the floor to a Q&A period. So without further ado, please welcome Andrea Johnson. Johnson and I am your federal conservative candidate. A little bit about me, uh, I was raised in Harvey, moved to Fredericton to attend university when I was 19 and I've lived here ever since with my kids. I do have three of my own and a fourth I took in a few years ago because three teenagers just wasn't enough. <laughs> so <laughs> my kids are my motivation to run in this election because I want to create a future for them where they don't have the pressure of moving away. I want my, I want to be able to see my grandkids in person at Christmas time and not just in a Christmas card. Career-wise, I have worked with and for small business. I don't need to tell you this stat, especially this room, but currently 50% of small business uh, startups will not make it to their 10th anniversary. And I believe that that has to change. Small businesses are the backbone of our economy and I think that it's important that we give them the resources that they need to succeed. I have helped businesses in many different sectors increase their trade and export revenue, and some of you are actually in this room. I know that you're not looking for $12 million for freezers like Loblaws. You'd like a little more time to train your staff and less time spent on paperwork. You'd like a break on taxes and payroll costs when, when, you, when you give a new graduate a job. And you'd like your bank to stop doubting you just because you're from the East Coast. Wanting a little tax break for the entrepreneur who takes a risk and goes without a paycheck because they have an idea, that isn't extreme. Accusing small businesses of being greedy because they'd like to keep a little money in their pockets to know that they're gonna make payroll, that is extreme. A conservative government will help small businesses like you by repealing the former Liberal government's tax increases on small business investments, reduce federal regulations by 25%, and actually assign a minister to report directly to the Prime Minister to reduce the red tape that you face every day trying to run your business. In my free time, I do enjoy being on the river with my fly rod. I am a licensed guide, and I'm passionate about all things hunting and angling. I have hunted and fished since I was a kid, and it was a huge part of my upbringing. 
The conservative government is committed to reestablishing the hunting and angling advisory panel to improve the conservation surrounding Canada's environment. We believe in going to the experts that, that look after our, our lands and our water systems and ask them what we need to do to help conservation. We don't believe that you can tax your way to a greener environment, especially when the biggest polluters receive the biggest exemptions, and then punish the single mom that has no choice but to commute from Burnham to Fredericton to go to work. Conservative government will invest in carbon capture technology. We will harmonize the recycling programs across provinces, and we will introduce a green tax rebate because we know that 12% of carbon emissions come from our buildings, and everyone wants to be able to afford to do their part. And we will take the carbon flight, carbon fight global. I've used this example many times uh, over the campaign trail, and it, I will not gonna lie to you, it was a bigger hit at the NASA's middle school than it was at the Shannox. But um, you know, taking the carbon fight global means for us is if you and 49 of your friends go swimming in a pool and you have to pee, you get out of the pool to go pee. You have to get out of the pool to go pee. But if you don't get your other 49 friends out of the pool with you, then, then you're not having any impact. And that's what we believe in taking this fight global. We need to have a leader at the helm that's going to be able to establish these relationships with China, with India, with Indonesia, because unless we get those uh, governments on board and, and helping them introduce this carbon capture technology into their, into their uh, into their worlds, then there's nothing else that we're going to be able to do to help that. Trying to balance a household is difficult, and that is why a Conservative government wants to make it easier on you by adding the Children's Fitness Tax Credit and the Children's Arts and Learning Credit, who will allow the flexibility of a household to give their kids a more active childhood through organized curricular activities. I'm, I was very thankful that none of my kids wanted to play hockey because it's, it's, a, it's a very expensive sport, and as a single mom working, trying to run my household, I, they wouldn't have been able to. Having this tax credit will help alleviate that for a lot of these families. I also know that university is very expensive. My oldest graduates from uh, St. Thomas at the end of this year. My youngest just started at Mount Allison at the beginning of September. With four kids, I want to give them the best chances to succeed, and under conservative government, there will be a boost to the RESP by boosting the government's contributions from 20 to 30 percent. Although I have spent most of my career supporting or creating jobs for New Brunswick, I also understand the need for immigration. With the current population in Fredericton being the largest, well actually in New Brunswick, being the largest to retire, we are going to have a huge gap. But, uh, <coughs> oh, I forgot Krista got in water. A conservative government will help safeguard economic immigration by helping provide and improve language training as well as improve the credentialing recognition program. I know that when I was in economic development for the province that this was a huge area. We know that we need skilled uh, workers. We know that we need the best and the brightest to choose New Brunswick to come here. And when they come here, we need a program in place to be able to recognize their education. I spoke to, to many um, individuals throughout the, the, the immigrant women group um, and different newcomers, even my next door neighbors. They came here from Nigeria a couple of years ago and he's a, he's a nurse, he was a trained nurse. And he gets here and he's now an accountant. And my ex-husband's an accountant, we don't need any more of them, but we do need nurses. Um, you know, with, especially with the health, health crisis that we're in right now. It's, it's simply unacceptable that highly trained and skilled nurses are being denied work because we don't recognize their credentials. Um, yes, yeah, so a conservative government will work to make your life more affordable with tax cuts that will help everyone in order for those who are the most vulnerable to get ahead. As a single mom, I know what it's like to live within my needs and that's why I believe our government should have to do the same. When your government is investing 20 million here, 50 million there without measurable outcomes, then your government is just spending. And I don't need to tell anyone in this room, but we have to stop using spending as a measurement of success. We have to have measurable outcomes, we have to have targets, we need to know. So when your government invests 50 million into healthcare, 
what are the measurable outcomes? How much of your, how much did wait times decrease because of that? How many more intakes were there accepted into our mental health system? Those are measurable targets and outcomes that we have to have, and your government should not be run any differently than how you have to run your business. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, so in short, in closing, I will be a great representative for you in Ottawa. I understand many aspects of your lives. I understand many aspects of your business, of running a family, of managing a budget, of, of working with immigration, with improving and increasing our economic development and creating jobs. One question is asked all the time of me, you know, what's your government gonna do to help, um, if elected, stop the outward migration? Well, if we have jobs here, that people can come out of university, make more than 35,000 a year, then people aren't going to leave. They're gonna to want to stay and raise their family here in New Brunswick, and that's why I will fight for that every single day. We need economic development in, in this community, and we look at and we talk about the environment, which is key this time around um, in, this, in this election. It's, it's top of mind for everyone. And, and it is as, as well for us as conservatives, but I keep bringing it back to if, if as a family or as a mom or as a dad, if I don't know how I'm gonna pay my bills this month, then I'm not focused on what I need to do to help my environment. And that's what, that's what the conservative government wants to do. So I will open up to questions, thank you so much. pretend that I do. Um, and I'm not sure what is in our platform on that the first time. I've, I've seen pieces of it. We haven't released the full platform yet, as I'm sure when you watch the news you, you hear that. Um, so it, that piece has not been released yet. I know what we've, um, on, a, on a global scale, one of the things that we're looking at um, because of the, the cost of real estate in, in cities like Toronto, in Vancouver, we know that a lot of that is, is not, um, it's an inflated market through money laundering. And so there are, um, I think the stat I last said I read was 10 billion a year into Toronto alone in real estate in cash. So we have um, talked about under a conservative government that those loopholes will be closed. Um, as far as the mortgage stress test, that I will absolutely get back to you on. Um, but yeah, I'm, right off the top of my head, I don't have that information. Thank you. Um, and as a woman, I really respect that. Um, I have a question for you in regards to health care. If, if you're elected, if the conservative government is elected, are you planning to renegotiate the trust of payments to reflect our aging population and really help us fund our health care in a way that we have found that? Yeah, so we know that um, the conservative government has committed to a 3% increase. We know that here in, in the province, Higgs is talking five, um, and I am fully prepared to work with our PC government here provincially. I mean, we know that that is the, you know, we have the most aging population, um, and, and that is, that is a, a, not a burden on our healthcare, but it's a, you know, it's a stress on our healthcare system, um, and a healthcare system where we're already in a crisis state. So. It is, you know, like I said, uh, the leaders talk 3%. We know it needs to be higher than that. 
and I'm fully prepared to work with Premier Higgs on, on getting that to where that needs to be. Thank you. You're welcome. Andrea Bob Chisholm, I'm an employer of 300 plus employees here. One of the biggest problems I think with healthcare is we have a lot of people that have doctors. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of friends who are doctors, and the amount of people who don't show for appointments or things, and there's no penalty, mm -hmm. absolutely no penalty. And those are the people that are causing a lot of problems with, with the system. Um, I, I think it's time we need to overhaul the Canada Health Act. I know some people will say, well, you're going to Americanize it, and that's not what we want to do. But we have to run it like a business. We have to make sure that people really respect the system and don't abuse it. I've never seen anyone talk about that. I think education, for me, most issues come down to communication and education. And, and I don't, and I think the first step to getting to where, to what you're speaking about is actually communicating and educating people as to what that impact is to our healthcare system. What that impact is to everyone else that has to now wait. I mean, I, you know, the last time I was at my doctor was over a year ago. And the other day I got a letter in the mail saying I have an appointment with a specialist in November or whatever. I don't even remember what it was for. It was that long ago. And so I think, you know, when we educate people on, on what the impact is of their behavior, on, especially on, in this, on a system where we're already in a, in a wee bit of a crisis, um, I think that's the number one step. I don't know if, um, I think that's probably more of a question for within the, the provincial um, aspect of our healthcare system. It's, I mean, like I said, I don't know what the answer is. I know that personally, when people know better, they do better. And so if no one understands what that, what that does to our healthcare system, then, then I don't have any skin in the game as a, as a patient that doesn't show up. I know my doctor charges. The, the other challenge I think we might have for our province is, although the federal government manages the Canada Health Act and ultimately funds it, provinces compete with each other. So, so Alberta will pay a doctor a lot more. Mm -hmm. Ontario will pay a doctor a lot more. A lot of doctors leaving Atlantic Canada because they make more money, better system. And I'm not sure how we can do that other than the fact that federal government would start to tighten up some of the rules and, and you know withhold funding if provinces don't participate. Uh, I think, if I may, actually physicians in New Brunswick, they are the third highest pay for family physicians in the country, according to Code 1, which is what they build for all physicians. So in regards to financial compensation for family medicine, the challenge is not that, the challenge is our recruitment incentives. So we need to be clear about what the biggest challenges challenge you that we're farther down than third. Well, in regards to the office one visit, which is what we use a code to determine, and the office uh, one visit, which creates 80% of the revenue for funding decisions, is the third highest in the country. We, we lose more doctors than we can. Absolutely, because of the receptive yeah. incentives. If I have over a million dollars, it's my number is getting out of Maybe we can I mean, continue that. Yeah, in terms I, of I think, you know, from a government's perspective, we do need to have more accountability and transparency into, into how those dollars are spent on the through the health care transfers for sure. So Well, I think, you know, first of all, I don't, I don't watch CBC, so I don't get any of my news from, from there. Um, you know, I know Mr. Shear, I've met Andrew, I've met Jill, I've met the kids. Um, the, the, the picture that is painted is, is not truly who he is from a, uh, 
you know, he's a racist, he's a bigot, he's a this, he's a that. None of those things are true. What is true is that he has stood up and said that he is pro-life, that he, he was raised Catholic, and that is his religious beliefs that he's pro-life. Um, and how I reconcile that internally is that, you know, we, we're, we're Canada. You know, every, we, we have, because we're Canada, that means that everyone's beliefs are, are their own beliefs. Um, and, and, and that's okay. No one has to, not everyone has to believe the same thing that somebody else does. For me, where it crosses that line is when it comes into policy. So your personal beliefs are your personal beliefs. And, and I can't make those wrong because they don't align with mine, the same as you can't make yours right because they don't align. Um, but if, when that crosses into policy, that's when I absolutely will stand up. As far as the LGBTQ plus community, um, you know, it's, it, that is an area that, that I fight online all the time. And full disclosure, I applied uh, as the federal candidate to walk in pride, spent $400 on my banner to walk in pride, and the Pride Committee denied my application. And so I met with an associate professor the other day from that community because the fight had been going back and forth about me calling me all kinds of horrible names. And, and I said, you know what? I'm not, I'm not fighting on Facebook. I, I, 2301755, that's my phone number, and my office is at 700 McLeod Avenue. For the love of God, people, come talk to me. Meet me face to face. And so the associate professor came down, we sat down, and we had a great conversation. He recorded it. I'm assuming it's going to be you know, out at some point. And the reality is, is that me, myself, because of who I am as a person, the Conservative Party and, and the charter that defines the, the behavior within the party believes that every single solitary Canadian deserves respect, equal treatment, protection under all areas of the law. Have we looked at, at every situation through every different lens? Probably not, you know, but um, you know, there is, there's always gonna be room to do better. And, and like I said, I mean, at the end of the day, I, I know where I stand internally um, and with my own morals and values. And, and to me, my job, regardless of whether I'm in public office or not, is to always speak up for those that don't have a voice. And that's something that, if elected, I would continue to do regardless. Thank you. Jan? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for being here with us today, Andrea. No, we appreciate it. Um, I, I wrote some notes down because that is very, well, for me, very important question. I was happy to hear you mention immigration and the Managing Director of Immigration Services for the region. Um, so we talk about a small business being the backbone
Thank you, Janet. Well, it, great question, and it is, like I said, you know, my background working with small business and on the economic development side, immigration, you're absolutely right. That's always been at the front of every conversation when it comes to business growth, when it comes to succession planning. You know, it, immigration is key. What I know of, of a conservative plan, and it comes from the leader, is we absolutely have to continue with immigration. We have to, there are some barriers. We need to maintain the integrity of our borders. So we need to start to prioritize our humanitarian immigration. I mean, we've got, you know, it's, to me, we can't hashtag welcome to Canada as our immigration plan and then and then have a hardworking grad student wait two plus years because they're stuck in the queue. So, so we need to kind of take things back a step. We need to make sure that our borders, that they're protected. We need to prioritize our humanitarian immigration and we need to look at our economic immigration and make sure that when people land and that they choose us, that they're able to put those skills to place in place uh, to work a lot quicker. And that is, you know, uh, second language training we're focusing on, as we, we will focus on as a government. Um, the, the credentialing issue with, as it relates to the education piece, that needs to be, that needs to be looked at. And, and there is no, you know, on the economic side, there, well actually on either side, there's been no negative narrative coming down through what the meetings that we have, when we talk about what the platform is, when we talk about what our speaking points are, when we talk about what needs to happen to move this country forward, um, there, there's no negative narrative on, on immigration at all. It's, it's something that is widely understood and accepted throughout the party is that, especially for me, for us, for this area, if we don't have it, we're, we're sunk. And, and we know that, the Conservative Party knows that, and Andrew Scheer knows that. Um, on credential recognition, uh, what do you see the federal government's role being in that? You know, one of the major challenges we face is that it's a provincial thing, and even more so, it's down to the association level. The credentialing body are pretty, pretty independent. So, how do you, how do you think the feds affect the cost of change there? Well, I mean, I think you know, first off, we would need to start looking at um, you know. To me, it's a skills gap analysis, and we look at what we need versus what, you know, the influx of, of where they're coming from, and then we start to go systematically go through their through their systems. I mean, in, you know, in India on the IT side, this park, you know, is the we need programmers, we need a computer science background, and so you know, having that working group or experts within the university system going into those school systems or that education system and you know, I, I don't think it's rocket science. I think we look at what our programs are here, we look at what their programs dictate there, and then we fill the gap. And part of the plan that we've been talking about is, you know, maybe there is a, a one-year overlap. I mean, we do it with our nurses now. We've, been, we've had over 90 nurses come in through the immigration program, um, and then when they land, they go to, uh, to a private college in Vancouver, the Omni College, and and they go from they go through it's a year to two year program and then they're and then they're out and ready to work as a as a registered nurse. So whether there is a, a bridging system from an education standpoint once they once our newcomers land here, or whether we send people into those schools um, in and then compare the curriculum. I mean, I, I think that's probably the easiest the easiest thing to do is to figure out how to how to fix that. Andre, look, um, we've uh, we've had all the candidates in, and uh, one of the things that I wanted to make sure each candidate understood is we really appreciate the, you know, the energy and effort that candidates put in and run. It. It's it's a polit politician uh, being political is not an easy an easy job. Well, especially certainly. for me, for those that know me. Sure, <laughs> um, and certainly you know service to Canada and the Canadian citizens should be you know it's an admirable thing you're doing. The question I'd I'd like to maybe hear you t talk to or speak about is if, if, if elected and in the official party of Canada, what is your number one priority? So I think my number one priority would be, um, would be the economy. I mean, I think we need to, not just because that is my background, but because it is what, you know, a rising tide lifts all ships, right? And so, you know, 
when when hardworking people have good, meaningful jobs, then then everyone does better. You know, there's less of a burden on our healthcare system. There's less of a burden on our you know on our social services. There's you know there's when when more people are working, things are better. And so that would be my number one priority. With that, I think comes um, you know a lot of different things that need to happen. I think you know, we need to look at having. I know that we done a lot here to have industry and government and academia at the table together looking at gaps, looking at what we need to do, um, you know, how do we help grow this even even more. I know we do a good job of that here in Fredericton, but I've seen firsthand. Um, and I think we need to look at that a little bit a little bit broader as well. Um, and I think, you know, this is the overarching priority is is I want to be I want to be the, the voice for our community. I want to have to be able to go to Ottawa and and fight for the issues that are important for us in this community. Um, you know, and I make sure about being political because it's you know for me there it's I I can vote for myself once. The leader can't vote for me at all. Anything else comes from the people that make up this this riding and. And my number one priority is to represent those people in, in every aspect. Maybe it's a little similar to Larry's question, but I, if you're the successful candidate, what do you want your legacy to be? Oh my heavens, Nora. You could have given me a heads up on that one. Um, I think, you know, I want my legacy to be at the end of, of whenever that, that the, the train stops, for people to look back and be able to say, you know what, she, she did what she said she was going to do. She, she spoke to the different communities, she spoke to the business community, she represented us as, as our government representative is supposed to. And, and that, that all voices felt heard and and taken and taken to Ottawa. I think that's you know I, I think of you know I look back at with Andy Scott, you know, and I don't think regardless of what political stripe you come from, you know, Andy Scott did a great job, and it's because he listened. And you know Keith Ashfield, same thing. He brought a lot of infrastructure here, and you hear people on both sides or all sides still talk about you know the Andy Scotts and and the Keiths, and to me, you know that's. That's what I want my legacy to be. I want people to know that I I said what I was going to do and I delivered and and I've made this area as successful as, as I could possibly make it. Yes. Um, Andrew, I asked a similar question to uh, to the Green candidates. You do the same. One. Um, I think perception-wise, the conservatives are seeing. Concerned party, whether that's true or false. Um, there, there's criticism of the carbon tax. I'm not going to want to debate whether they did that properly or not either. But the, the, the reason for the carbon tax was supposed to pay for the expense of climate change. So, if, if you will, in order to fight climate change, we need to do expensive things. We need people to drive uh, different types of vehicles. We need solar power, renewable energy, that sort of thing. All that costs money. Mm -hmm. Without a, I mean, okay, you're going to do how are we going to pay for the inevitable expenses of climate change? I mean, it's, it's, it's a known fact. It's yeah. coming it, beyond even with our current government. Other governments are saying the same thing, so it's not just their thing. It's something that's coming. How do the conservatives see paying for climate change? Well, the, so not to debate the carbon tax, but the carbon tax was put in to modify human behavior. Um, and and, and that's, that was the whole premise behind it. The, the money from the carbon tax that's collected goes right into the coffers. It doesn't go into research, it doesn't go into infrastructure, it just went into making life more expensive for those that cannot modify their driving behavior because they live in Burton and work in Fredericton or because they work on a Sunday and our transit system doesn't work on a Sunday. Um, part of what the government, the Conservative Party is focused on is, is, uh, is, is managing our budget. And you know when you heard you know Andrew Shear mentioned talking about um, cutting foreign aid by twenty five percent, 
and cutting corporate welfare by 1.5 billion, you know, so that the Loblaws don't get free freezers when they're the richest family in, in the country. Um, so, you know, there, the money is there currently. Uh, and, and a lot of them, we have been beaten up a lot on our, on our environmental plan because it's not, there's, it doesn't need to be all these great big pie in the sky things. We need, to me, it, it comes back to accountability. I mean, harmonizing, we don't even, you know, we're talking about a lot of the, the other platforms have these huge, expensive, multi billion dollar plans when we don't even have a harmonized recycling program across our provinces. You know, we don't have a composting uh, program here. You know, I live in a, in a court off of Argyle Street. I don't have a recycling program at all in my court, and I live in David Coon's riding. So there's, there's a lot of things that, you know, when, when you peel away the rhetoric and, and the anecdotal information, there's a lot of small things that, that every single one of us can do. And to me personally, locally, I don't think our uh, climate is a, is a partisan issue. Globally, absolutely, it's a partisan issue, um, and we need to fight the fight globally. But locally, I think, you know, we look at banning, we hear the ban, you know, ban single-use plastics. Yeah, how many kids are giving up their cell phones? It's not going to happen. You know, um, we need to work with conservative governments talking, part of the plan is working with a lot of these companies to reduce excessive packaging. You know, we don't need all of that. My personal opinion on that, stop buying it. You know, and then you look at the, the that plastic bag didn't march itself into the belly of that whale in the ocean. You know, we need to look at at our cruise ships that are dumping massive amounts of waste in international waters. We need to look at China that's dumping massive amounts of waste in international waters. You know, each individual Canadian, we are polluting six times faster than anybody else. That's a fact. Um, you know, the, the looking at the 12% carbon emissions from your household, having a, a green rebate system so that people can afford so you want to do, um, you know, more environmentally or climate friendly insulation, um, siding, a new heat pump, you know, there's up to $3,800 a year for, for Canadians to, to get that back so that they can start to make those changes for themselves. And to me, and this isn't, you know, on any party talking points, but to me, it's, it's an individual, it, every single one of us needs to do better. Um, and so, you know, we, like I said, we don't have items on our, on our environment platform that are going to that are costed at 28 billion dollars but at the same time if if we don't have uh, if we're not investing in, in carbon capture technology I mean we need to do that we know that there are there's parts of that in China right now that are working and if only 10 percent if only 10 percent of the businesses in China utilize this technology that's that they're testing then we're, we're good. You know, it's, it's not going to take a lot of high ticket items. It's going to take a lot of accountability and it's going to take, it, it's going to take a, a leader at the helm locally and, and in Ottawa to make sure that, that everyone's held accountable clear around the board. So Pharma, Universal Pharmacare, I was at the Nurses Association um, uh, debate a couple weeks ago, and the, uh, the moderator said, because of course we know that Universal Pharmacare is in the, liberals have been talking about it, it was a first uh, promise in 1997, it was again promised in 2004, and it's again in 2019 back on their, on their platform. Pretty sure it's not gonna happen. Um, and the other parties have it as well. So the moderator said, and this is how she started her question, she said, so 20% of Canadians don't currently have access to affordable medications. What is your party going to do for universal pharmacare? And I thought, okay, well you just said only 20% of Canadians don't have access to affordable medications. So why would we talk about a $30 billion a year ticket item when what we need to be focusing on is that 20% that doesn't currently have it? And, and the Conservative government is focused on making sure that those that cannot afford their medication, um, and we know the doctors say it's uh, um, 
I forget what the number is of, of patients that don't actually fill their prescription because they can't afford it. Though that's who we need to be helping. That's who we need to be focusing our funding on is making sure that those that cannot afford it can. Um, and and that's what that's what we're looking at. I mean, you know, if 20% can't, that means that 80% of the country currently has a drug plan or has access to affordable medication. So we need to focus on the most vulnerable. We need to focus on the ones that, that can't afford it. How do you do that? How do you do that? Well, I think, you know, it, I mean, right now, it, it is funding. It's going to have to be money, obviously, for people that, that don't have access to it. Um, and it's it's part of, it's it'll be a social program that is created to make sure that under a certain, either under a certain, uh, salary level or um, if you're already on this social program then it's it's an even that exists today um, but i know my mom she canceled her blue cross she's 70 and she canceled her blue cross and because it was 400 a month and uh probably within the next four months after she canceled it she got cancer and the, so chemo, you're good, you're covered. Well, partly through her chemo, she got a blood clot. That's a thousand bucks a month. You know, so now you gotta decide between, you know, not dying of a stroke and, and your groceries. And so that's, that's what we're focused on, is making sure that those people can afford to not have to choose between groceries and, and medication, or paying their heating bill and paying for their drugs. And it, and it would be a, a social program. And the Conservative Party is, we, we know that we have to look after our most vulnerable. And, and as far as what that individual plan looks like on the, on the farm and care side, I don't have all of those details, but it is something that we know that we have to do. hasn't been done since the 1960s, it's probably time to, to look at it again. Um, yeah, to me that, that just makes good sense. It doesn't mean that anything is gonna change, but you absolutely, you know, if we haven't revisited something in, in 60 years, we should probably revisit it.
our area, that alone will allow us to afford more, and that will make our $120 to $150 a month as opposed to a third year mm -hmm. I mean, I, to me, um, I go back to accountability at the individual level. I mean, you know, when you look at, at and I said this the other night last week at the UMB debate, you know, when you talk about, um, well, you know what, government should, government should step in there and do something about that. Government should play a bigger role over here and do something about that. Uh, conservative government doesn't want to be any more in your business than it already is, and quite frankly, that's a wee bit too much as it is today. And so that's, you know, to me, I think mean, it's back to human individual accountability. Um, you know, the more power we give government and the more live ways that we put funding in, which is going to come out of our taxes, so the more that we pay, the more that government has, then the more free programs we have, which actually means the less control that we have over our own lives. And so I hear you, first time homeowners are, you know, I remember the first time I bought my house in, oh my gosh, 2001, I, you know, five years later I was like, geez, why didn't I even buy this? It's totally not what I should have bought for a house. But you know, people need to, to learn, and I think it's to me a lot of it comes back to accountability, and that's not a, a conservative answer. That's a that's a personal answer. If, if you're making a purchase then of a house, which is the single biggest purchase you're going to make in your life, then you probably should make sure you're educated all the way around about it. Questions for uh, Ms. Johnson? No? Well, thank you, Ms. Johnson, for being with us this morning. It's, it's always great uh, when, when uh, those who are running for public office take the time to, uh, to be with us. And with that, that concludes our 2019 Federal Candidate Series. Uh, keep an eye out for those videos that we'll be posting on the website in the coming days as well along with the Questions to Count initiative. Sign up for that email if you haven't already done that already. Uh, before we go, I